end the webinar over to you. Thanks for doing this. Great, thanks, Chris. So, uh, really, just without further ado, I want to introduce Peter McFarland. Um, he is uh, just an income tax professional. He's an attorney, and I approached him recently and said, "Look, everybody wants to hear about what's happening with taxes, and um, can we just uh, have you talk about this to our audience?" And he graciously said yes. And you don't want to hear me; you want to hear him. So, you can take it away. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much for the very warm welcome. Um, you know, and and I'm actually very impressed with all of the branding that you guys are doing with the uh, the education here. It's really that between the podcasts and the YouTube channel, everything looks awesome. Um, even the choice of the website name and everything, I, I love it. Um, you know, one kind of uh, housekeeping thing, um, which I, I, I think we mentioned, uh, but I just want to, to reiterate, is you absolutely ask questions as we go. I have the questions box broken out on this uh, GoToWebinar pane, and uh, I'll be monitoring it as we go. Um, don't uh, write anything in the chat box uh, just because I don't have that up. Um, so if even if it's not a question, put it into the question box because that's where we'll see it. Um, aside from that, uh, you know, this is a, a, an incredibly meaty topic as we've talked about. And so if I'm talking and what I'm saying is just not making sense, that's perfectly fine. I'm human too. I slept, you know, however many hours last night, less than eight hours. Um, it's our busy season. I'm, I'm running a little uh, ragged. And so if what I'm saying is just not making sense, don't be afraid to uh, to ask a question about it. Let me know. Hey, just run run, run back through that because I didn't get it. Um, you know, it's probably on me. It's not on you. So just let me know. Um, and you know, it's it's a it's a complicated uh, tax system that we have, and to try to explain it in an hour is sometimes a very tall order. So just a little bit about me before we get started. You know, I am an attorney. I went to the University of Denver, Sturm College of Law, passed the Colorado Bar Exam on the first try, something I'm still incredibly happy about. Um, then went back, uh, and my family thought I was nuts, but went back to school after I passed the Bar Exam and went to the graduate tax program. Uh, there I received my Master in Laws in Taxation, which is about as exciting as you would expect. Um, but, you know, really focused on the tax code, learning the tax code, everything about the tax law that I could. And ultimately, I was able to parlay that knowledge and my, uh, my experience at the low income taxpayer clinic there into being the associate attorney here at Long Law Group. Formerly, we were Estelle and Long, now we're Long Law Group. Um, but I've been with this firm now for five years. Um, I've been featured in the Colorado Real Estate Journal several times, uh, written uh, you know, articles about various topics, uh, investing with your IRA, testing your lease knowledge, uh, business entity checkups. And uh, you know, the primary focus of my business and, and my practice is actually on business entities and setting them up and uh, all the planning that goes along with them. Today, we're going to actually be talking about a slightly different topic, and it's going to be more tax-driven than, uh, say, the business entity uh, discussion, although I do have some slides on business entities and we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, but you know, just uh, speaking generally about what I do most of my time, it's actually uh, LLC creation, corporations, uh, partnerships, you know, those kind of things, and advising on, um, on issues that are related to them. Um, but at any rate, if you're interested in, in learning a little bit more about us, there's our website. Uh, we are on Twitter, Facebook, and I'm on LinkedIn. I'd love to uh, personally connect with everybody on this call on LinkedIn. So don't uh, pull up LinkedIn right now, right? Stay with me on the webinar, but maybe afterwards, if you like uh, what I was saying or you know, kind of want to, to get to know me a little bit better, feel free to connect with me. Um, and just a little bit about us, you know, as a firm, we specialize in business and tax-related matters. And we provide legal counsel to companies of all sizes as well as to individuals. Specifically, we really focus on tax preparation and planning. Uh, we do have a, a wing of the firm that uh, you know prepares uh, tax returns and also does bookkeeping. Uh, we look at business structuring and planning. Uh, I will uh, engage in estate planning as well as real estate law. Um, so you know we try to be as much of a one-stop shop as we possibly can for tax and uh, business, uh, you know, bookkeeping, compliance, and uh, uh, you know as well as uh, some of the actual legal concerns with real estate and estate planning and asset preservation. So uh, just a little bit about us there, but. Uh, if, if anybody's been on a webinar with me before or even seen me speak down there at your castle, um, you know, you know, I like to give you a roadmap, just a little bit of an idea of where we are, where we're going to be going. Um, this uh, slide will actually show up quite often during the webinar just to kind of give you an opportunity to recenter with me. Um, I recognize that it's tax law. It's not necessarily the most exciting thing. And it's also 10 in the morning. And so, you know, many people may not, you know, still be firing on all cylinders. Um, if you find yourself kind of, you know, uh, spacing out or whatever, you know, I'm not going to have hurt feelings. I get it. 
Um, but you know, the roadmap kind of gives you an opportunity to recenter with me. It's like, okay, you know, I kind of spaced out on the last section, but now we're in a new section. You know, I'm going to kind of uh, focus on this one. You know, I, I get it. So. Uh, anyways, this roadmap will show up quite often, but because this is an opportunity for me to get up on a soapbox just for a little bit, I'm going to give you a slight opening perspective, which revolves around the idea of the tax code kind of being this, uh, you know, train wreck, right? Um, and maybe there's, you know, kind of a, a, a collision course between the investor, the real estate broker, um, really any taxpayer and the tax code. Uh, and that may be fueled, you know, in large part by these new changes and the, the kind of uh, large uh, tax changes that we saw at the beginning of the year. I, it's funny because um, I, over the weekend, took yet another CLE, a continuing legal education class, um, that talked about you know, all these tax changes and you know, it's just always good to get as many perspectives as you can get. And it's funny because uh, the moderator, the speaker on this CLE, the very first thing he said about the changes to the tax code was that it's the biggest changes that we've seen since 1986. And in some ways that actually is true um, because the tax code before was written in 1986. Uh, now there's been kind of incremental changes as we go along and you know the, the system that we had at the end of 2017 was not wholly similar to what we had in 1986, but by and large, you know, the, the, the bones of the structure came from 1986. Now we're seeing changes to those bones. And so if you think about it, you know, that's quite a lot of time to go by without a um, very large media update and suddenly now we have it. And uh, the time frame with which that was passed, um, boy, it, it came down the pipe really fast. Uh, and so, you know, as a practitioner, it gives me stress and heartburn because, you know, we have to implement these changes and plan for these changes, but we haven't had a whole lot of time as a profession to really think through it, um, you know, properly educate ourselves, properly uh, kind of uh, work through the ramifications and come up with the best planning tips and those kind of things. So, you know, the opening perspective here, I may have overcooked it with the explosion and the bullet train and all that. It's maybe not as, uh, as dire as all that. Um, but at the same time, you know, what I'm going to present today is going to give you an idea of some of these tax changes. Um, but, you know, things are going to change. Um, the IRS themselves are going to give more uh, feedback and guidance on what some of these changes means. The Department of Treasury is going to do the same. Uh, Congress themselves, if they can agree to do anything, is actually going to maybe make some technical corrections to the code. Um, and so, you know, where we are now is not even where we may be six months from now. And so it's really important to stay on top of the changes, um, surround yourself by advisors who are comfortable with the changes and seeing kind of what's happening and, and can hopefully keep you up on, on the latest developments because we're going to see more developments. There's no doubt about it. So, you know, maybe not a, a train wreck or, or something, once again, may have overcooked it there, but just keep an eye out because uh, it, there's the potential that, uh, that things are going to move and move quickly and change, and we need to be on top of that to make sure that we're still in compliance. So with that, uh, you know, the opening perspective, you know, I get it down off my soapbox here and, uh, you know, we'll talk about tax strategies. And the first thing I wanted to talk about with tax strategies has to do with electing what's called real estate professional status. Um, before I talk about what real estate prof professional status is and what it means, I have to talk a little bit about income in the code. Um, the income, the income that you earn can actually be categorized into three different categories of income. There's what I call kind of active income. There's also what I call passive income. And then there's what's called portfolio income. Um, I'm not going to talk about portfolio income. We don't necessarily need to uh, you know, get that far down in the weeds here. But what's important to know is that income from activities is going to be split into different buckets, right? And so you have active income, which could be, say, your W-2 wages if you're an employee, a 1099 income if you're a contractor, you know, capital gain, investments, dividends. That looks a little bit more like portfolio income, but that's going to go into one bucket, right? Into the other bucket, we're going to have passive income. And what I mean by passive income, the best example I can give you is rental income, right? Um, it's by nature, and actually the way that the code is drafted, it's what they call per se passive income. Because generally, you know, the, although we know being a landlord is more involved than maybe what the general public thinks, 
um, you know, the idea is that it's kind of that mailbox money, right? Um, and, and it shows up each month and you're not necessarily always involved with the production of that income. So they call it passive income. The whole reason it's important to think about these different buckets is because, you know, from your passive activities, the rentals, uh, kind of more on the, the head, um, losses from these passive activities can only offset your passive income. And so if you th this infographic is really complicated really quick. But if you think about it, losses are going to be uh, split into active losses, so to speak, and also passive losses, depending on the activity that generates the loss, right? Then when you've determined whether the loss is an active loss or a passive loss, you can only offset the similar type of income with that loss. And so why this is relevant, in, especially in the, the rental context, is because you might have really massive depreciation write-offs on a rental, and it may create kind of this paper loss while the property itself is actually still cash flowing. Um, it would be any kind of loss that's created by that depreciation deduction can only offset the passive income. If you're also, say, a real estate broker and you have the active income, it'd be really great to be able to use the passive loss from your rental property and actually offset some of that active income too, right? So number one, you can use the full amount of that loss, um, but also so you can actually pay less tax on the active income you're generating from closing the deals, right? So what we want to try to do is, is rather than kind of, um, you know, split our losses or income into these different buckets, what we want to try to do is actually just you know, create one bucket where everything's going to mix together and losses from anything can offset uh, income from anything. And the way that we do that is by electing this real estate professional status with the IRS. Um, there's another exception that has to do with uh, your modified adjusted gross income, as long as it's below a certain level. Here on the slide, I'm saying $150,000. Um, you know, then you, there's another way that you can do this, but by and large, for most of us, we're going to be looking at, and for you in particular, we're going to be looking at the real estate professional exception. Um, and, you know, so if we can do that, uh, you know, I, I guess it, it's a great potential election you can make with the IRS, but how do you do it, right? Let's talk about the mechanics or how you qualify. So to be a real estate professional, you actually have to meet two tests. And, it, this is probably the most complicated piece of what I'm going to talk about today. So once again, if I'm talking and it's just not making sense, it's not landing with you, please ask a question. Let's uh, back up and clarify, right? Um, but to be a real estate professional, you have to meet two tests with the IRS. Number one, you have to spend more hours on real estate activities in which you materially participate than non-real estate activities. I'm gonna parse through what some of this language means. Um, but the first thing is basically you just have to spend more time on real estate activities than you do on anything else. Then number two, you have to spend more than 750 hours in the year providing services in that real property trader business in which you materially participate. So there's kind of two, I call them flaming hoops that you have to jump through. Number one, more than half your time has to be spent in real estate activities. Number two, more than 750 hours in real estate activities. So what are these real estate activities or these real property trades or businesses to use the words exactly out of the code? It's actually very, very broad. It, we're talking development, redevelopment, construction, reconstruction, acquisition of properties, conversion of properties, rentals can count, operation of properties, management, leasing, brokerage. It's very broad. And actually all of the time spent in each of those different uh, activities can be amalgamated to meet that 750 hour requirement. Um, so, you know, if, if you are a broker and you have rentals and maybe you're involved in a few rehabs, um, then, you know, it should be pretty easy, I would say, to meet this requirement and something that you should maybe look at doing. So I do have two questions here, um, and I'm going to, you know, just slightly take a detour to answer these. Um, so Tony asks, you know, do you have a list of items that realtors can deduct? Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about deductions in just a little bit, Tony. I don't have a ready-made list um, of what realtors can deduct, um, but you might look, there's an IRS publication, and at the moment, the, uh, the number of the publication is actually escaping me. Um, but if you shoot me an email, Tony, I can send you a copy of the publication. And uh, it actually just has a laundry list of items that businesses in general should look at deducting. Um, and you as a, a real estate broker should be able to, uh, to continue or uh, at least uh, consider deducting what they have on, on that list. 
So more to come in just a few slides, and then you know, Tony, definitely feel free to reach out, and I can send you a copy of that publication. Michelle has a question as well. Um, when you say spend more time on real estate than anything else, does that refer to work hours? And um, Michelle, I guess I, I want to know a little bit more maybe by what you mean by work hours, but you know, the, the main thing is, is that I won't ever qualify as a real estate professional. And you know, that includes if I buy a couple rentals and I start working as a real estate uh, agent. Um, the reason is because I'm an attorney, right? And I have a nine to five, 40 hour, ideally 40 hour work week that's never that short. Um, but you know, I theoretically am spending the bulk of my time as an attorney, right? And so even if I begin some real property trader business, um, you know, I'm going to be spending more than half my time in the attorney role versus a real property trader business. Um, so hopefully that helps kind of answer that question. For real estate brokers who you know are, are out there making the deals, um, there should be no, and that's kind of the only thing that you do, there should be no problems showing that you're spending more than half your time in these real property trades or businesses. But for a typical investor who's got a nine to five job, they're a teacher or something, they own one or two condos, they're clearly not real estate professionals, meaning they can only deduct up to the amount of money they bring in for rent. They can't take a deduction against their active income as a teacher, say? Correct. Yeah. Teacher is kind of an interesting one, though, because uh, maybe they actually could qualify as a real estate professional if they're managing through the year and then they have summers off, right? Because maybe, maybe they can show actually more than half their time is actually spent as that real estate professional. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the point's well taken. If you're working um, you know, full time as a, a bookseller at Barnes and Noble or something like that. Yeah, that's going to be your primary activity. Um, you know, the, it, these real estate professional cases are really interesting because um, the hour requirements really come down a lot to documentation and how well you do document. Um, I've litigated a few of these cases in tax court, and it really comes down to the uh, the uh, I guess validity of the uh, logs that you provide, and you do have to keep an hourly log showing that you meet these hourly requirements. Um, you know, one example I can give you was uh, my, oh, the, the IRS somehow always manages to find a bulk of hours to disallow and make it so that the uh, number of hours that they will allow is actually sitting right on the fence. Right, and so it's like, okay, you need to show 750 hours, and we will concede that you have 700 hours, but not 750, and so you're gonna have to litigate over 50 hours, right? And, and the, number one, the judge is gonna be extra mad when you come in and you say, oh, we were so close, but we just have to litigate these, you know, extra 50 hours. Um, he says, why didn't you just settle, right? Um, but aside from that. Um, you know, I can give you just a real quick example of the, the two different scenarios. One was a client of mine, you know, had the IRS was willing to stipulate somewhere around 680 to 700 hours. We were looking at, you know, trying to get the extra 50 to 70 hours allowed. And um, ultimately, he gave me two bankers boxes uh, full of documentation showing what he spent his hours doing. And uh, I actually showed up downtown at the IRS office and, you know, lugged in these two banker boxes of documentation. The appeals officer looked at it and said, mm, I don't want to go through that. Let's talk about a settlement. Right. Um, the other scenario was my client gave me just a day planner and said, good luck. Um, and I provided that to the IRS and the IRS disallowed a lot of hours. Right. Um, so. Uh, volume is not necessarily the answer, although in this case it did make a difference. Um, but you can see the importance of your record keeping because if it ever is challenged, it's really important to be able to show uh, what you spent your time doing. So Michelle, um, getting back to your question about spending more time on real estate than anything else, hopefully that helped. And you say, okay, this means this is my primary job. And that's, that's really it. You know, you, you have to show that more than half your, your time uh, spent kind of producing this income is is spent in these real property trades or businesses, right? Um, okay, Chris asks, are the items you are going to go over true for the current tax code or the new tax code or both? And the answer is new tax code is really what I'm looking at. Um, 
you know, I, I can talk about what kind of the current state is and then where we went. Um, that's perfectly fine. And there actually is quite a bit of overlap between the two. Um, but Chris, if I'm talking about a specific topic that's, you know, really hitting home for you and you're wondering whether it's the current tax code or new tax code or where we are, um, definitely ask the question, you know, because I, I'd love to make that clear for everybody. Um, but just so you know, because we're, everybody is clamoring about what this new tax code means, that's really going to be where my focus is today. Okay, so Michelle has a question for me. Um, I do not have my real estate license, but I'm a contractor for a real estate company doing all the transactions for the office as a 1099 contractor. Would I qualify as a real estate professional? So Michelle, I think another way to ask the question would be, you know, you're a contractor, independent contractor, but you don't have your license. Is a license required to be a real estate professional? And the answer is no. Um, as long as you spend more than half your hours in these real estate uh, activities and uh, you can show that you spend more than 750 hours in you know, these real property trades or businesses, um, then you should be fine. And if you look at um, some of these real property trades or businesses, I mean, heck, you could just do um, it's say construction and that's it, right? And as long as you spend more than half your hours in construction um, and then you meet the 750 hour requirement only doing construction, you can still be a real estate professional. You don't need your license at all. Um, so hopefully that helps with that uh, question there. Um, now there's, I'm glossing over some of the really important wording in the code here. And I've underlined these words, real property trades or businesses. We talked about what those look like. That's my laundry list of items right there, right? The other one is materially participate. So you have to spend more hours on real estate activities in which you materially participate than non-real estate activities. That's the first prong of that rule, right? Second is that you have to spend 750 hours or more during the tax year in real estate trades or businesses in which you materially participate. So what is material participation? It's this awful seven factor kind of seven uh, rule test that they have in these temporary regulations. And I can tell you the number of times I've litigated this makes me sick. Um, but at any rate, uh, there are a couple different ways, seven different ways you can meet that material participation requirement. Um, all of these are not necessarily going to be relevant, so I'm just going to hit the, uh, the most important ones. Number one is that you participate for more than 750 hours in the one activity. Um, so, you know, that's uh, it right there. It matches the second prong of the rule. It just, you know, if you participate in one activity for 750 hours, you've materially participated. Um, another way you can show that it showed material participation is that your participation is substantially all of the participation by all individuals. What that means is basically you're the go-to person for the activity, right? You're the person who really is doing the activity. Nobody else is spending more time than you. Um, the third one is also relevant. Uh, basically, you participate for more than 100 hours during the tax year, uh, and that activity is not less than any other individual. It's kind of another way to, to think of that second uh, possibility there. And then the seventh, uh, the very last one is the one that I think is more important or important to think about, facts and circumstances. What you have to do is show that your participation was regular, continuous, and substantial. Even though that's in the regulations, I've never seen the IRS uh, concede on that point alone, um, but technically it is possible to win saying that, hey, my participation was regular, continuous, and substantial, and make arguments why it was regular, continuous, and substantial. But if you can do that, then you're showing that you're materially participating in these activities. So we're pretty far down in the weeds now. I'm sure some of you have, uh, have yeah, I've lost some of you, but at any rate, um, this is just another way to think about this. And it's kind of the idea, once again, of jumping through these flaming hoops. I like the idea of the flaming hoops. Um, so to be a real estate professional, you're gonna first participate in a real property trader business as that's defined by statute. And as we saw, that was a really broad definition of what a real property trader business is. So, you know, you participate in one of those then you're gonna jump through flaming hoop one, which is just that you're going to spend more than half your time pursuing real property trader businesses, right? Then you're gonna jump through flaming hoop two, which is to spend more than 750 hours in a year pursuing all of these real property trades or businesses. And then I actually add a flaming hoop number three and say that you then have to ensure that you materially participate under one of those seven different tests in all of these activities. So. Hopefully that helps kind of parse through that. It's one of the most complicated concepts, I think, in the tax code that I have run into, or at least uh, regularly run into. There are some real doozies in there. 
Um, but at any rate, uh, hopefully that, that helps you guys frame this a little bit more. Um, Tara has a question for me here. Um, so it says, just to be clear, as a real estate agent, how should we be logging and tracking our hours? I'm a full-time agent and I use a day planner. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a really great question. Start with the day planner, Tara. Um, you definitely want to mark uh, you know, where you were at any given point in the day, what you were doing. Um, what I would look for is kind of the who, what, when, where, and why, right? Um, who did you meet with? Where did you go? When did you go there? Why did you go there? What's the, the kind of business purpose of going there? And then from there, back it up as much as you can with something that um, actually uh, ties it to, uh, or gives a little bit of a data point of, um, you know, the, the real estate purpose. So let's say you go and, um, you know, you're looking for prospective properties as a rehabber, right? Or maybe looking for your next rental or something like that. Um, what I would do is mark in the, the log book, okay, you know, I, I left my house at whatever uh, time I, you know, arrived at the property at whatever time. Um, and then maybe when you get back home, um, I would actually print out, you know, kind of like the, the Redfin or Trulia or, you know, whatever printout of where you went. Um, so that way, uh, you know, the, the IRS can actually see that you were considering that property, um, you know, and, and that it would be a legitimate, um, you know, investment or something along those lines. So hopefully that helps, Tara. Um, you know, it definitely asks more questions there if you're wondering more about maybe what the documentation should look like. I had a, a, another, you know, everybody loves hearing the war stories, right? But I had another um, real estate professional case that I was litigating and uh, the logbook, the clients had very clearly gone back. So their logbook said where they went, kind of the, the who and the what, but it didn't ever have any of the, the timestamps on it. And so when they gave me the logbook to provide to the IRS, um, it's really clear that they had come in after the fact and said, I spent three hours doing this, four hours doing that. Um, and this really aggressive IRS attorney uh, actually said that, um, you know, first off, he wasn't going to accept the logbook because, you know, there were problems with the contemporaneous nature of it. And, you know, kind of these after the, the fact ballpark estimates of what they had spent doing any particular activity. He didn't like that, and he was pretty sure that he would win in court on that. I'm inclined to agree with him. Um, but at any rate, uh, he actually said, if we didn't, um, <laughs> if we didn't, you know, kind of begin to see things the way that the IRS saw it, he would actually send the logbook over to the um, to the crime lab. They would test the ink to test the relative dates of when the ink was written in the book, and ultimately he'd make a fraud referral. Um, if necessary, and this was the most aggressive agent, uh, it was an IRS attorney, but the most aggressive IRS attorney I think I've dealt with uh, in the history of my doing this. And, um, you know, the, those fraud referrals are a big deal. That's, that's crime and, you know, you're looking at, um, I don't think it's a felony, but at any rate, maybe a misdemeanor. Um, but, you know, these poor taxpayers, they were just trying to get their deduction and, you know, prove what they were doing. And in their minds, they were doing the right thing, right? But ultimately, uh, we had to back off of our position there. So that's not to make you afraid of electing real estate professional, because it is a legitimate uh, tax planning strategy and something that the code allows and the IRS does allow it. Um, but it is to highlight the importance of keeping this, these records and keeping them correctly. Okay, so a question from Jackie here. Yeah, Jackie, this is a really great question. Um, I'd like to know what we can write off as a business expense, perhaps we are not thinking of. Also, I heard client entertainment is no longer allowed as a business expense. Um, I'm gonna talk more about that, and I think it's actually even the next slide, or if it's not the next set, it's the one after. Um, so we're definitely gonna get there, but to give you a preview, uh, yes, entertainment has been changed quite a bit, and you're right, you're going to lose the deduction for that. Um, so there is a theory about how you might be able to get that back, and I'll talk more about that uh, here in just a few slides, but it's a really great question. Jackie, if I don't fully answer your questions when we get to those slides, definitely continue to, to ask more questions on it, because that's something that I'd love to talk more about. So. We're, we have to prove to the IRS that you materially participate in each of these activities, right? 
it, what's interesting is the IRS actually takes the position that each individual rental is its own activity. And so if you go back, I'm going to go back really quick to this definition of material participation. The first one is participate for more than 750 hours, right? Um, let's just go with that one. If we're going to try to use that 750 hour rule to show that you materially participate in each of your rentals, for instance, you're going to have to show that you did 750 hours in each rental, right? And that may be really hard because if you have five, seven, 10 rentals, right? You're gonna to have to be Superman to put in those kind of hours to materially participate in each one, right? So the IRS and, and really Congress was smart enough to figure this out and realize that that was a problem. So they allow you to group your activities together. Um, you have to group them based on some kind of logical flow on why they're grouped together. So grouping all of your rentals makes sense because they're all this rental activity. Um, but you might have a hard time just so you know, grouping say rehabs or brokerage income or something with rentals because it doesn't really make sense. Um, and so you may have to treat each of those separately. Um, but at any rate, talk to your tax preparer if you're thinking about doing this or you currently have done this. Uh, made this real estate professional election because uh, you can actually group your activities together and that makes the material participation uh, component of what you need to prove so much easier. Um, just so you know, typically with record keeping, you want to keep your tax returns somewhere around three to four years after they're filed. Um, there's other circumstances where you want to hold on to them longer. I'm just kind of saying the general rule. Um, but if you make the election to group your activities, hold on to that tax return like gold, because if the IRS ever audits in the future, the first thing they're going to ask is whether you made that election and you have to actually produce that. Um, so you may have made the election say, and this was a real uh, case that I litigated, they made the election back in 2002, but that return was well gone by the time they audited in 2015, right? Um, and so we weren't able to show that we made that election, so we had to prove material participation in each activity which turned out to be impossible. Um, so just hold on to that election like gold. So John uh, says, are you familiar with the app program TaxBot? Is the TaxBot program app a good way to log activity? Um, John, it, it may be useful to organize you, but ultimately uh, I have run into problems with using electronic record keeping with the IRS. Um, there's two reasons why. First off, the, the tax code and the regulations are written in a really specific language that actually require you to, um, to keep paper records. So, you know, first off, the tax code is very antiquated. Um, and, it, you know, to meet the letter of the law, uh, these kind of, you know, new age, um, <laughs> newfangled uh, kind of uh, record keeping tools are not necessarily going to pass muster. Um, because it doesn't meet the, the black letter law of what the law requires, right? Um, the other thing is that the IRS is always looking for contemporaneous records because they view that as trustworthy. So, you know, if you have a written document uh, the same year when you took the deduction, the IRS thinks that's pretty trustworthy. If, on the other hand, you have an electronic document that can easily be modified at any time, including three years later when they're auditing you, they don't necessarily view that as the most uh, trustworthy document. Uh, when, for instance, people are audited, uh, auditors oftentimes will ask for QuickBooks. Um, they wanna see profit and loss statement, balance sheet, general ledger, and you know, all that. And QuickBooks is a really great tool to quickly produce those reports, but they never just trust QuickBooks. Then they wanna see your bank statements. They wanna see the receipts, the invoices. And the reason is because they wanna verify what the electronic a record actually shows with contemporaneous records back from in the day when you took the deduction. So it may be helpful to organize you to keep track of things, but ultimately I would revert back to, uh, as, as painful as it is, some type of contemporaneous log and really handwritten probably is the best. And I know just what a pain that is, but you know, there's no better answer than that. So I mentioned that deductions probably was gonna be the next section and sure enough, that's where we are. So. Um, you know, let's go ahead and talk about this. And if there's more questions about that real estate professional status, just drop them in the box there. I'm happy to go back. Um, so let's talk about deductions. There is an upside. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, the, the quick preview that uh, uh, entertainment was going to go away. Um, the upside, if there is one, is that the standard deductions actually double. 
And so for many of us, the question is, well, heck, are we even going to itemize our deductions anymore, right? If the standard deduction before was $6,350 for a single individual, well, heck, as soon as they bought a, a primary residence, they probably were going to begin to itemize their deductions because they probably paid more in interest, right? So with the standard deduction coming up and doubling, now it's going to be $24,000 for a married couple many of us just simply might not itemize anymore. And if we're not itemizing, then the, uh, or the entertainment expense may be less relevant, right? That's kind of true of a lot of these uh, deductions that have you know, kind of disappeared. The idea was, let's just increase that standard deduction. Um, number one, it makes administering the tax returns a lot easier for the IRS. And then number two, the need to audit is so much less because so many more people are going to be just taking the standard deduction. So that was kind of the idea. Now, whether it's going to work or not, you know, we'll find out. Um, but that's that's kind of the idea. So the upside is that you're going to have a massive standard deduction. Um, the downside, or well, the other upside, by the way, is that the capital gain exclusion on the sale of a personal residence, um, if you live in the residence for two out of the last five years, uh, you can exclude up to $250,000 of capital gain if you're a single person, $500,000 if you're married. That exclusion survived um, the Trump changes, and so uh, you know, for for uh, the real estate community, that was a really big deal. And they were talking about changing it, and you know, they were talking about changing the time frames and you know, those kind of things. But um, but by and large, this uh, this exclusion actually survived. So that's I would say one of the biggest upsides. So um, sorry, Leilani, if, if I butchered your name, I apologize. But um, you know, we do have a question here from, from Leilani. Back to the real estate professional exception, is there a deduction? And the answer is yes, um, there is a deduction. And the idea is that you're going to deduct your passive losses, going back to the idea of those different buckets, you're going to deduct your passive losses against your active income. Um, so it can be a really powerful deduction, but it, it isn't always going to be the best fit depending on what the rest of your income looks like. And so before you look at doing this real estate professional exception uh, or exemption I, or status or whatever, um, I would definitely talk to a tax preparer, uh, our firm, you know, CPA, your current tax preparer and see if it makes the most sense for you. Um, Chris has another question here. Uh, isn't the standard deduction going to gradually change over time, i.e. decrease? Um, so a lot of the changes that went into effect are actually scheduled to uh, sunset in, I think it's 2026, and, uh, the, and Congress will have to actually act to extend them or change them. And uh, heck, we may actually see a lot of corrections coming by anyways because this is just so different, and actually there's been some unintended consequences they've already figured out. Um, and so we may see some changes already. So I'm not aware of any scheduled uh, decrease other than in 2026 possibly, um, but either way, um, that's where we are. Typically those standard deductions will also uh, change year to year, but they normally increase to, to counteract the effect of inflation. Um, but great question there, Chris. Okay, so the downside of these new post-Trump post tax deductions, um, number one, mortgage interest, the deduction for mortgage interest change. Um, if you're staying put in a house that you bought before December 15th of last year, there's no change. This, the old rules apply. But if, on the other hand, you purchased a house after the 15th of December last year, um, the cap on how much uh, of the acquisition uh, amount that you can deduct the interest on actually reduced. And so it used to be a million dollars of acquisition debt. Now it's $750,000. Um, there are special rules for refinancing. So if you're looking to refinance or one of your clients is or something, um, there's going to be special rules. They need to talk to their tax preparer. But at any rate, that mortgage interest deduction changed. Um, the biggest surprise to me was that HELOCs actually changed. So you used to be able to take out a HELOC and you could use the proceeds of that HELOC for really anything you wanted. You could pay off student loan debt. If you owed the IRS, you could pay that off, credit card debt, you could take a vacation, uh, you know, whatever you wanted to do. And the interest that you paid on that HELOC actually was, going, was deductible. Um, that said, under the new regime, that's just not possible. Um, a HELOC, interest paid on a HELOC is actually not deductible. Now, the door was left just slightly open on that because if you're using the interest to put in substantial improvements to your primary residence or even a second home, um, then that interest actually is deductible. 
Um, and the $750,000 cap still applies, but there's that one tiny exception where if you're putting the money into you, into a home that you actually own, that's fine. But it, it, you know, the old idea of like paying off credit card debt or something like that and getting the interest deduction, that's just not possible. And just to clarify, so a lot of our clients will take that money and put it as a down payment on an investment property. So it's not just a home you own, it has to be your primary or your secondary. You, you basically can't use this anymore um, to purchase rental properties or to fix up rental properties and get the deduction. You can use it, but you can't get the deduction. Is that right? Yeah, that's 100% right. Yeah, that is sure. You could get a HELOC for any purpose that you wanted, but to get the deduction it has to be on your primary residence or the second home absolutely so yeah it, it, exactly to Charles point a lot of my clients did the exact same thing they pulled the, the equity that they had in their house and buy rental properties and do whatever else um, but we're going to see a significant uh, change in how that uh, is going to work moving forward so Tony has three questions here um, first off so does this affect purchasing a home and uh, yeah, for high net worth clients, I think it does uh, affect purchasing a home, particularly the mortgage interest deduction more than the HELOC, um, because the, the cap came down from a million dollars to $750,000. So if your you know, clientele is kind of in that high range, a million dollars or more, um, they may actually buy a smaller house, right? Because they're not gonna be able to deduct the interest on anything over a million dollars. Um, and so I think that actually gets to your second question there, Tony, about over a certain amount. Um, and then your third question, if you have lived in your home since 2002 and now sell it and buy another home in the state, how will that affect someone? And the, the answer is that they're acquiring that new property after 12, 15, 17. And so they're going to be uh, locked into this new uh, mortgage interest deduction for one. And uh, unless you're pulling on the HELOC to uh, build the new house, um, the anything on a HELOC is not going to be deductible. So that's a really great question. Um, so the question is from Tony again, so there's no mortgage interest on a home over $750,000. Um, I don't know that that's true, Tony. I think you can deduct the interest on the first $750,000, but then anything over that $750,000 does not um, uh, qualify for that deduction. Yeah, there's a proration. That's a pretty complicated proration. So if you buy a house at one and a half million, what you have to have your accountant do is figure out what portion of the interest you're paying is assigned to the first 750000 deductible and then what you can't deduct. And it's not easy. Yeah, that sounds like what I do with IRA returns and it's a, <laughs> it's a bear to tackle. But, but it's, it's possible. We do it. We do it. But um, yeah. So uh, another large change has to do with property tax. Um, so all state and local tax, and that includes property tax, sales tax, you know, everything else, um, the aggregate total of all local and state tax that you can deduct is now limited to $10,000 for a married couple. So um, for those who hold a lot of rental properties, we're going to see a change in how you deduct state and local and property tax there. So you're saying if you own 50 rentals, and each has $1,000 taxes, you can only deduct 10,000 of the 50,000? That's my understanding, wow. Yeah, yeah, I know yeah. I, and yep. you know, once again, I would look for more guidance on that, but yeah, my understanding is you're gonna be limited as a married couple to just that $10,000. Even if they're in LLCs? Even if they're in LLC, well, <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Peter uh, created all my LLCs, so I'm sitting here uh, asking him this pertinent question. Yeah, um, actually the LLCs I think may be different, and that's actually a really great question. That's something I would actually want to spend more time on. Yeah, so. I told Peter I was up at five this morning working on my taxes, so this is a very relevant question to people like me, so I'll get back to us. Yes, I will. I will look into that, um, but that's that's a really fabulous question. and. You know, that, that kind of structuring is a legitimate part of what we do. There's tax evasion and tax avoidance, right? Um, tax evasion is what uh, Al Capone did and lands you in jail. Tax avoidance is what I make a living doing, which is figuring out legitimate ways to not pay a single penny more to the IRS than you need to. And that right there, that type of question and that type of answer, those are the types of questions that get to tax avoidance mm -hmm. and what we really want to do and make sure that you're paying you know, what your patriotic duty is, of course, we all pay tax and, you know, it's just part of the, the deal. Um, but, you know, we don't necessarily want to make any unnecessary gifts to the IRS, right? And if you think the IRS is going to come to you in two years and say, oh, gosh, you know, this was in an LLC, you didn't have to pay this, here's your money back. You know, yeah, I'm still waiting for my check, right? 
Um, so a couple questions have lined up here. So Diana asks, um, again, these changes affect 2018 returns and not 2017 returns. That's exactly right, Diana. We're talking about changes for 2018. So, you know, the advantage here is that you're getting the word early on this. So that way you're not incurring a lot of expenses during the 2018 year thinking they're deductible and suddenly you have a surprise at the end of the year. Um, you know, this way, you know, you're, you're well ahead of the game. But yeah, the old rules certainly apply to what everybody is preparing now and what Charles was doing this morning. <laughs> okay, uh, John says, if I travel to another city and view property and meet with another real estate agent, is any part of the trip deductible? Air, hotel, et cetera, explain rules. So that gets into the next point here, which is meals and entertainment. Um, the, John, the rules surrounding travel and everything else actually largely escaped the changes. Um, and so entertainment, no matter what, is not deductible. Um, so if you're going out to this other city and you decide that you're going to go to a live show or, you know, a movie or, you know, whatever it is you may do, that portion of the expense is no longer deductible. But the meal is still deductible, subject to the 50% limitation. And then the, the travel, the hotel and, and all of that, that should be deductible. Now the amount is another question because if you can show that the business trip was 100% business, then great, it's 100% deductible. If on the other hand, it straddles a weekend, right, and you worked Thursday and Friday, uh, but, and then Monday, but you took Saturday and Sunday off, then the, the expenses that you incurred Saturday and Sunday, those are not deductible, but the, the days that you actually did work, those would be deductible. So, uh, you know, it's, it's complicated, and the rules there are actually very fact-driven and, and how it's gonna play out. Um, but by and large, entertainment, no longer allowable, but travel and meals in that uh, particular circumstance is allowable. So Tony, does the new mortgage interest apply toward the loan amount or the purchase price? Um, that's a good question. It's gonna be the loan amount. Yeah, because that's the, that's the only thing that's going to be relevant for the interest calculation. So that's a good question for sure. Okay, uh, Jackie asked the question, what is the 50% limitation on meals? And it's just as simple as this, Jackie, 50% of the expense that you incur, that's deductible. So the idea is that you know, I'm paying for my client's meal and getting the deduction for my client's meal, but I'm not getting a deduction for my meal, right? And so if, if I take Jackie out, you know, we go to whatever Indian restaurant, my, my fiance is Indian, by the way, that's why I think about that. Um, but, you know, we get some really killer curry or something and it costs $30, um, my deduction is going to be $15 because the IRS just figures that half of that cost is deductible, right? Yeah, Mandana, you asked a very good question, which is, uh, you know, is it true that the $10,000 cap on property tax only applies to your own home, not rental property? Rental property expenses deduction go on Schedule E, which is absolutely true, which has no cap. Is that true? Again, I, I actually want to look more at this. I don't know that I have the ready answer for you here, even though it's terribly relevant to the discussion, and I apologize that I don't have that ready answer. This, once again, is that slide I was talking about with the train and the explosion and all that. It's just this is so new that we as practitioners are struggling, right, to figure out exactly what all these changes mean and what the best strategies are going to be around this. My sense is that if I dug into this, that rental property uh, taxes are going to be deductible because you're producing income and you're, you're not necessarily rising to the level of a trader business. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but it is for the production of income and there's different sections in the tax code that apply, be it to uh, section 212 or section 162 that talks about what's going to be deductible or not. And my sense is that rental properties that tax is going to be fully deductible, but I just haven't seen something that says for sure one way or the other. So, you know, I'll take a look and, uh, and you know, definitely email me, shoot me a line. I'll let you know what I figure out here, but that's just my sense. Really great questions though, guys. Thank you. Yeah, Tony, uh, he says, so if I bought a home for $850,000, does that mean that we cannot claim taxes on the 100,000 that is over the $750,000 amount? I think that that's more or less right. Um, if you have an $850,000 mortgage, 
you're going to get the interest deduction on the $750,000, but just like Charles was saying, there's going to be a calculation done that's going to disallow a proportionate amount of each interest payment that you made in the amount that the 100 that you're over that 750,000 bears to the whole amount, right? Um, so there's going to be a calculation, a portion of each of your payments is going to be disallowed. So if you paid, say, $16,000, it's going to be more than that probably on, on that mortgage. Um, you know, maybe only 14,000 of that 16 would be allowable, right? Just to use a really quick example, the numbers are not even remotely right on that, but, but yeah. Um, so hopefully that helps you, Tony. Um, okay, so Tony says, so not a huge deal. And it, yeah, I mean, it, it's gonna really depend and it's gonna be subjective to the client, right? Um, if, you know, if they're a high net worth client and very driven by the bottom line, which some of our clients are, um, you know, they may decide that a million dollar house is okay versus a $1.2 million house because they want to keep the, the interest deduction, you know. So what that does on the, the housing market will actually be really interesting to see and you guys will have a better uh, beat on that and kind of a better um, feel on the, the pulse of that than I will. I'd love to hear what you guys see over the next year. Um, okay, Chris. If someone has an existing HELOC and it is renewed or extended under the new tax law, is it governed by the original tax code or the tax code in effect when the HELOC was renewed or extended? Chris, great question. Yeah, um, and you know, it, I, my understanding is that in 2017, you're going to have the deduction on the HELOC because the old tax law is going to apply. But then in 2018, you're going to lose the deduction because the new tax law is going to apply. On the HELOC, it, I don't believe it matters when the loan was actually originated. On the mortgage interest deduction, though, it does matter. Um, if you purchased the house before 12-15-2017, the old rule is going to apply. You're grandfathered in, right? But on the HELOC, I, that deduction is going to disappear. So, Hey, Peter. <laughs> so to really get more nuance on here, what about for HELOCs on investment properties? versus primary residences. I don't know that that changed. Jeez. Yeah, you know, I don't have the answer to that, Chris. Um, I'm gonna be completely honest with you. Chris, as far as I know, that didn't change, um, but I can't cite chapter and verse. You said did or did not? Did not, I don't think it did. And But Peter's the master here. <laughs> and, I'm, <laughs> and I'm shrugging, if I'm honest. Um, so, no, that's, once again, it goes back to the idea of the property tax, right? Now, my sense is that because you're engaged in generating income off of these properties, that's going to be different. There's going to be different rules that are going to apply to that. Um, so it certainly begs the question, talk to your tax preparer, email me, you know, let's, let's do the due diligence. But before I tell you anything and send you up a path, I, I do want to do the due diligence on that. But great question. You know, that's, that is the question. That's what we need to be asking. So. Um, <clears throat> Adrienne asks, is the mortgage interest cap per property or whole portfolio? Um, well, that's a good question, Adrian. Um, you know, it, I, the, the mortgage interest deduction is going to be relevant, I would say, more for your personal residence than the whole portfolio. So, you know, I, I think it's going to be per property to kind of answer the question on the nose, but you know, writ large, I think we're gonna be more interested in, in whether it's on a personal property or a rental property, but great question. Did the mortgage interest deduction change at all for rental properties? I thought we're only talking about your own rock or a second home for the change from well, a million to 750. Yeah, I think it's related to the same question that I'm struggling with, which is, you know, how does the fact that the rental properties change from a primary residence, you know, and the fact that you're generating income off the property does that mean that the deductions change? My sense is yes, the answer is different, right? And so probably the deduction is going to be different from what's on the personal home. The mortgage interest limitation I'm talking about here, I think it is limited to the personal home. So yeah, great point, yeah, yeah. Okay. You can see these yeah. Trump tax yeah. changes, it's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So, all right. So. Another huge change that came along with the Trump tax changes uh, have to do with depreciation and bonus depreciation. Um, so uh, basically the change here is that you can now use bonus depreciation for appliances, equipment, furniture, landscaping improvements, uh, you know, rental properties, and used in rental properties. And what this basically means is that you're going to actually be able to increase your uh, depreciation deductions, recover the cost of these improvements much quicker 
Uh, and ultimately, if you think back to the real estate professional election, um, the fact that you can write off more of the cost of these uh, improvements means that uh, you know maybe you'll actually generate some passive losses, which then can be used to offset your active income, right? Um, so you know there were, were changes here. I'm not going to get too far deep into the weeds on this one because depreciation can take up a whole a whole webinar unto itself. Um, but just be aware that there were changes to this, and it's relevant for rental properties. So is this like if I if I do work like I, I change if I put a new roof on one of my rental properties on September 28th instead of having to to write it off over a period of years I can write off the entire amount. Well, the roof is a little bit different. Um, Capital improvements? Exactly. Yeah, I guess I use the word improvements loosely here um, because what I guess I would look more for for tangible assets, right? What what the examples I have here are like appliances, equipment, furniture landscaping, right? Um, so if you need a new uh, washer, dryer, um, refrigerator, you know, something along those lines, then you're going to get this bonus depreciation. A roof, because it substantially increases the life um, of the, the asset, that's going to be treated differently under the code. Um, so yeah, that, that may not work. What we're talking about too for this bonus depreciation is that it's going to, the recovery period on the depreciation is going to be less than 20 years. Um, so there's you know certain classes of assets that qualify for that um, particular treatment, um, but ultimately what we're talking about is is that we're also not going to be able to use bonus depreciation on the building itself, right? Um, it's going to have to be taken over the assets or the uh, I, you know losing using the term loosely improvements that you're putting into the property. So things like a new furnace, new air conditioner, yes. and roof, like I was doing it this morning, I put a new furnace in that. Doesn't sound like I'm getting any better tax write-off because the furnace isn't. That that would be more like a capital improvement. It's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer for a furnace in particular, but actually there was a different change that I think actually helps you, and it's not even in my slides. Um, but there was a, a a change to the 179 expensing, um, and so for everybody. Um, section 179 says rather than depreciate something over a useful life, and I don't know offhand what a furnace might be, but let's just say for the sake of argument, you put a furnace into to use, and then you know the tax code says, okay, you're going to depreciate that over 10 years, so you get you know a, por a portion of the cost over 10 years. Um, instead of uh, that, 179 says, great, you spent six thousand dollars on a new furnace, just take the expense of the six thousand dollars this year. You don't even have to depreciate it, right? Um, there was a change in how 179 works, and for things like HVAC and furnaces and those kind of things, I believe now you can 179 expense those, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So that's depreciation. <laughs> uh, on to the next biggest change, and this has really, really uh, overarching. Um, implications for a lot of taxpayers, and it also changes a lot of how we go about entity selection. Um, now, I'm seeing that I'm at the hour, so if anybody needs to leave, you know, there's no hard feelings, and you can always reach out to me you know, with questions or anything that we didn't cover, um, but hopefully you can stick with me. I'm just going to keep going if that's all right with, uh, with everybody, but at any rate, um, you know, the, some of the biggest news when this tax bill was being debated and ultimately when it was passed was that the corporate tax rate was going to get cut from 35% to 21%. Um, there are several different types of business entities, you know, there's corporations, but there's also what we call flow-through business entities. And by and large, we used to always set up flow-through business entities because they were so much more competitive compared to uh, the old corporations, right? And so when I'm referring to flow-through entities, what I mean is an S corporation, a partnership, um, there are disregarded entities that can be treated as a sole, a sole proprietorship, and then also what qualifies for this 199A deduction are trusts and estates. Um, but at any rate, um, <clears throat> so what, what the 199A deduction, it was kind of snuck in, and I don't think a lot of people actually were aware that this was in the tax code until much later. Um, but what it is is that if they're cutting the corporate tax rates from 35% to 21%, Congress was uh, uh, concerned that these so-called flow-through entities were no longer competitive. And so the 199A deduction is actually a way to keep these flow-through entities competitive with the big corporate tax cut. Um, so, you know, I'm just going to go with a really oversimplified version of how this uh, deduction works. 
And you know, ultimately, you need to partner with a tax return preparer to be sure that you're doing this deduction correctly. Because I can tell you right now, this is very complicated, and it gets very complicated very quickly. And just thinking about the hot button issues that the IRS is probably going to want to audit, this is probably going to be one. Um, so you want to make sure that you're doing this and you're doing this correctly. Um, but 199A, what it basically says is that flow through entities can deduct 20% of their qualified business income. So basically, as long as you're generating what the tax code defines as this qualified business income, you can just take a straight deduction of 20% off of that. Um, it's huge. It's a really big game changer for, for business entity owners. Yeah, it, yeah. Charles is saying he's never heard of this one. And yeah, it's it, it got it, it just kind of snuck in, you know, but but it's one of the biggest changes and one that actually I'm very excited about. But what is qualified business income? How do we get there? This does not include wages and salary, right? So if you're a shareholder or an owner in an S corporation, the amount that you pay yourself in wages, that's not going to count towards this qualified business income. If you're an independent contractor, great, your income is going to be able to be counted towards this qualified business income. But if you're an employee like I am at the law firm, I don't qualify because I'm getting wages, right? I'm getting a salary. So Qualified business income is not going to include wages or salary. It's not going to include short-term capital gain or long-term capital gain or dividend income or interest income. Those last ones, if you think about it, are a little bit more like uh, investment income, right? So not like a W-2 job and not investment income, but any other income is going to, to qualify. Um, so it does include 1099 income. So it's a really big deal for, for real estate brokers. K-1 income, if you have an interest in a, an S corporation or a partnership or something like that. Um, but what about rental income, right? Um, almost certainly rental income <laughs> qualifies. Um, there's a qualifier in there because we're actually gonna have to look for clarification from the Department of Treasury. Um, the reason is because the income has to come from what's called a trader business. And trader business, even though it's used several times in the tax code, it is never defined in the tax code. And so we have 100 years of case law from courts that's interpreting what a trader business is. But even in 100 years of court cases, the courts have never actually nailed down what a real definition of a trader business looks like. So the question is, you know, the amount of time and energy and your involvement and everything with rentals does that rise to the level of a trader business? That's kind of the, the question mark, the gray area that we're gonna need clarification from the Department of Treasury and Congress on. That said, a last minute change, and the reason that I say why rentals almost certainly qualify, there was a last minute change made to the bill. It was like an 11th hour change that just snuck its way in. And it, it snuck its way in to specifically accommodate somebody who's involved in rentals. And so, Given the specific nature of that one change, it seems like rental should qualify because why else try to sneak in this last minute provision? Um, but you know that's going to be kind of the tension. We have this one last minute change that seems to say that Congress was thinking of rentals when it drafted this deduction. But then on the other hand, we have this language that says, well, it needs to be a trader business. And sometimes getting the, the kind of passive nature of these rentals to look like a trader business is really difficult. So look for more clarification to come about rental income, but if you're getting 1099 income or something like this, this 199A deduction is gonna be huge for you. So let me ask a question. Let's say you have a house and you make $10,000 in rental income. Does this mean you can deduct 20% of that and pay taxes on the 8,000, or you just take the 10,000 and then do the normal deductions depreciation and you see which one is better? Is it either it's, or? It's not an either or, it's an and in addition, in addition to, in addition to you take 10,000 minus 20% is 8,000, and then from there you start deducting everything off? I think you, it, the order is different. I think you start with your, your rental income, then you take out your deductions, whatever's net of that, then you're going to take 20% off. off of that. And then pay your marginal tax rate on that number. Wow, that's yep. a brand new one to me. It's it's a huge deduction. It's yeah, it's a it's a it's a game changer. It's a really big deal. Now there are limitations on whether you can take this. Um, the first is that your taxable income needs to be under three hundred fifteen thousand dollars for a married couple, one hundred fifty seven five hundred for single. Um, if you're over that. Um, you know, th then an analysis needs to be done because you still may qualify for a certain amount of the deduction, but it's going to phase out. It may not be the full 20%, right? 
Um, so you know, there, there are limitations on when this actually kicks in. But you know, the other limitation, and it's unfortunate for me, is that um, you know, there are these so-called specified fields um, that just don't qualify. There's the fields of health, law, accounting, actuarial science, performing arts, consulting, athletics, financial services, brokerage services, or any trade or business where the reputation and skill of the employees is the principal asset. And if you think about it, it's interesting because architects and engineers under the 1986 code were included in this same group, but in this new tax code, they're actually left out. And the reason they're left out, I, I it, for the longest time couldn't figure this out, but yesterday I was reading more about this and somebody made a really good argument that I like and it's that what they're trying to do is give the deduction to people who are involved in building things, right? And architects and engineers are involved in building things. They're involved in creating new houses, buildings, you know, whatever. Engineers create cars and, you know, whatever else. And so they left them out because they want people who actually build things, you know, we're making America great again, right? That's the idea. Um, on the other hand, law, right? Well, I'm not building anything. <laughs> I'm sitting at a computer and typing and you know and, and reading and making you know these these uh, you know weird tax law arguments, and so I I should not qualify for that, right? So you're saying here, architects and engineers do get the write-off. They do okay, left it, out. It sounded it, uh, like left out of the well, write-off. Well, so so there's yeah they're they're left out of the laundry list of the people that are uh, you know no longer allowed, but problem is, um, you know, there's this kind of way to claw them back in, which says, well, any trade or business where the reputation and skill of the employees is the principal asset. So if you're a rock star architect who designs the Burj Khalifa over in, you know, Dubai, um, maybe you get clawed back into that definition, you know, but on the other hand, if you're just a, you know, run of the mill architect here in Denver, um, you know, maybe you are still qualified, right? So we need another area where it's extremely gray, right? So David has a question. It says, does this mean if all of my investment properties are held personally, as opposed to in an LLC or S Corp, I cannot take advantage of this deduction? Uh, David, I'm completely oversimplifying this deduction. I think as an individual, you still will be able to take uh, the, the deduction, um, even on a Schedule E. Um, so that should be fine. A great question, though. All right, so 199A, really big deal, big game changer. That's something we absolutely should have talked about. I'm glad I got it in. Um, S corporations and self employment tax. So, you know, one of the questions that I kind of uh, identified that might be relevant to talk about today is self employment tax. How do we structure around it? Number one, the 199A deduction may actually change quite a bit of how we approach the self-employment tax question, and it's going to be driven very much by your individual circumstance and whether it makes sense to, to try to be uh, even more uh, cute, so to speak, and try to, uh, to structure around self-employment tax. But there is a strategy that we can use, and it involves an S corporation. A really quick word about LLCs and S corporations. Um, it, during the, the podcast today, or I'm just, or during the, the webinar today, I'm just going to refer to S corporations because I think it's easier. But we could just as easily substitute an LLC for that S corporation. The reason is because LLCs are so flexible. Um, the tax code, by and large, was written in 1986. Now we have the new updates. Um, but you know, LLCs they were largely a creature of 1991, which was roughly five years later. Um, from when the base of our tax code from 1986 was drafted. Um, when the LLC showed up about five years later, Congress didn't just scrap the tax code and start all over. Uh, what they did was just say, okay, if you set up an LLC, come to us and tell us how you want it to be taxed. So an LLC really can be a disregarded entity, a partnership, an S corporation or a C corporation. Um, but today, you know, once again, I'm just going to be referring to S corporations, but the main idea is just that, hey, you could also be an LLC tax as an S corporation, right? So if you are, say, a sole proprietor, or you have a single member LLC and everything for tax purposes is going to flow back to your Schedule C, um, this is more or less what your tax situation looks like. You have income that's going to go into the LLC, and you're going to take what's called an owner draw out of your sole proprietorship, right? Um, on that owner draw, 100% of the income is going to be subject to self-employment tax. Um, so that's a roughly extra 15 to 16% tax. I think it's 15.3% or somewhere around there. 
Um, but anyways, 100% of your income is going to be subject to that extra self-employment tax, right? Now, we, the new uh, wrinkle in all of this is that now we have this 199A deduction as well, which you would qualify for even if you had a single member LLC there. Um, so, you know, that's going to change the picture. And once again, when we select or think about whether we need to select a certain type of entity, that 199A deduction is really going to change things. And uh, situations where before we might have decided that an S corporation might be best, it may change. Um, so the alternative and what you know, I kind of want to talk about today is how an S corporation impacts self-employment tax. So same scenario, you, know, you have income that's going to go into the LLC or the S corporation. And from there, you're going to pay yourself that income two ways. Instead of just the single way the owner draw, uh, number one, you're going to pay yourself a reasonable salary and you're gonna pay yourself a shareholder distribution. The reasonable salary has self-employment tax levied on it, so you pay the extra 15 to 16% on the reasonable salary, but the shareholder distribution just you know, completely escapes the self-employment tax. And the shareholder distribution actually qualifies now for that 199A deduction. So uh, you, know, you get kind of deduction on deduction there. Um, but at any rate, um, the, let's see. Yeah, so it, the main point there is that because we pay ourselves the two ways, uh, we actually have a portion of our income escaping self-employment tax entirely there. Now, this is a dated slide. I really should have updated it because I'm saying that self-employment tax is 13.3%, which now it's 15.3 roughly in there. Um, but you can kind of see the, the breakdown here, right? Um, on the left, I have that sole proprietorship, that single member LLC. Um, you know, they're going to pay roughly, you know, it should be about $15,300 in, in self-employment tax there, um, rather than the $13,300. Then you have your regular federal and state income tax. And so, you know, you wind up paying quite a bit of tax there in the, uh, the sole proprietor single member LLC. Now with the S corporation though, because we're going to split the $100,000 of net income in my example here, uh, between distribution and wages, we're only paying the 15.3% self-employment tax on the $50,000 of wages rather than the full amount of the $100,000. So when you go through the permutations and the math there, you know, basically you're saving um, you know, quite a bit of money there just by making the distinction between what's a distribution and what's a wage. And then now, in addition to these savings, we have the 199A deduction. So you know, self-employment tax and S corporations can be a really powerful planning tool um, you know, for real estate brokers who are, you know, on the 1099 income, the, the contractor income, they can be really powerful tools. Um, so, you know, you should talk to your tax preparer, talk to me, you know, we can run the numbers um, and see if maybe an S corporation would make sense for you. Um, so moving on, you know, just kind of generally talking about business entities, maybe what we might want to look at for different types of real estate investors. This may apply to you guys personally, or you might have clients, right, who are looking for rental properties or uh, the next deal, and maybe they're looking at a rehab or something. Um, and, you know, there's going to be a potential answer for what kind of business entity they should be looking at setting up. Um, you know, a quick caveat, uh, one size does not necessarily fit all on this. Um, you know, a lot of it, particularly now with that 199A deduction, is going to be driven by your personal, um, you know, situation. And then, you know, the other thing is what do we want, what else do we want to accomplish with the business entity? You know, are you looking for medical benefits? Are you looking for the maximum asset protection? Um, you know, it, maybe not in real estate, but, you know, eventually will the business go public, right? There's an answer for that. Um, how many people are going to be involved may be relevant. So, um, you know, it, there's a lot of different uh, considerations we want to build into this uh, discussion. And, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, but I'll give you an idea of what I might look for. So, you know, for rentals, typically what I set up is a parent subsidiary relationship, which is kind of represented on the left there. Um, the top LLC, which is represented by that triangle, um, I would look to actually have that be a multi-member LLC. So you need more than one owner. The reason that I do that is because uh, single member LLCs are slightly problematic here in Colorado. Uh, we have an adverse bankruptcy ruling which suggests that a creditor would be able to pierce through the LLC veil, uh, reach personal assets, uh, also force the LLC to sell a rental property to make good on a debt of the owner, which is very problematic. Um, so if building in a multi-member LLC, um, you know, some, some other interests, other owners to protect, um, just makes the LLC structure stronger in general. 
Um, when you have more than one owner in an LLC, then you have to look at filing a certain type of tax return. Um, so in this case, I would look to file a partnership return for that LLC. But then below that LLC, I set up single member LLCs that are disregarded entities. And the reason that the single member LLC is okay in that context is because if somebody pierces through that, that single member LLC, they wind up back at that multi-member LLC and that's where the protection really is strong um, before they get to personal assets or other assets within the structure. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the structure I look to do there. The advantage of those single member LLCs, by the way, is that the whole structure only needs to file one tax return. So in this scenario, we have three companies but you could have 15 different companies, and as long as they all roll back to the same multi-member LLC, you're only going to file one tax return for all 15 companies. So, you know, it, it compartmentalizes your assets, compartmentalizes risk a little bit, um, but then ultimately it also is really lean come tax time. You're not paying the CPA more than you need to, uh, and it's easier to report, and the bookkeeping, I think, is a little easier, too. Um, for fix and flips, for brokerage income, wholesaling, um, you know, I'd look to maybe create a, another LLC there. It'd have to be a separate LLC because the tax structure would be a lot different. Um, ultimately, we'd look to maybe create that LLC as an S corporation. Um, but, you know, the new 199A deduction might actually change that discussion a little bit, um, just depending on what the, uh, the net income looks like in the company and maybe what makes the most sense. So I would create a totally different structure than uh, what I would keep in the rentals. Number one for asset protection, if something were to happen on the rental side, then your income stream from the brokerage income is still safe. Um, a creditor wouldn't necessarily be able to reach that. And then um, also the tax structure can be much different, which can be beneficial to you. Um, so that's kind of some suggested uses of LLCs there really quick. You know, closing thoughts, just going back to the idea of this uh, tax code as this bullet train, you know, on a collision course, that kind of thing. I mean, you can see it happened even in our discussion today, right? We were wondering a little bit more about what does the property tax deduction mean for rentals, uh, the mortgage interest deduction. Um, the thing is that we just don't quite have all the answers at the moment. Um, we're gonna be looking for clarifications to come and maybe even technical corrections coming out of Congress. Um, so it's just, it's a, an interesting time. We haven't seen a change like this really since 1986. I think the guy on my CLE was right. Um, so, you know, a lot of changes are in the works. Uh, they, they've already passed. Um, now it's just figuring out, okay, how do we administer these? Um, so, you know, once again, may have overcooked it here with the dramatic nature of this slide, but um, it's a really interesting time to be talking about tax and, and finding out what's happening, you know, kind of in these scenarios. So with that, I'll just turn it over to any more questions that we might have. Um, and thank you guys very much for showing up today. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Hey, Peter, I've got a question here for you. Uh -huh. So going through these um, tax changes, half of me is like, wow, I need to change some things to take advantage of this. But the other half of me is saying, huh, I'm still digesting this. You, like, of other, like a lot of other tax professionals, are still getting all the details figured out. Should I just wait a few months, let things disseminate, or what would kind of be your, your recommendation on timing as far as like changing things versus waiting and seeing till things settle down? Yeah, it, it's a really good question. Um, and one that I may not necessarily have the answer to. Um, even in the CLE that I was attending, um, we were talking about the timing of things and you know, there's a lot of really great advantages right now to say a C corporation, right? Like I was saying, the, the corporate tax rate changed from 35% to 21%. And so for a very high net worth client, it actually might make sense to look at a C corporation because overall they might pay less tax. But that said, we would hate to structure things in a C corporation and then just a year or two later, suddenly everything changes and now they're locked into a C corporation and they, you know, we'd have to restart depreciation and look at taxable events to move properties and, you know, whatever. And so it's, it's a totally fair point and one that I think we're grappling with because we don't exactly know what's going to happen. Number one, like I was saying, a lot of these changes are set, are, um, are set to sunset in 2026. Um, so, you know, we all know what Congress is like now, now to project another eight years into the future and say whether, you know, Congress can actually get anything done or if we're still so bipartisan or, you know, we, we're not even stepping into the politics of it. Um, you know, we may have a really hard time uh, deciding 
as a nation, what our tax system should look like, right? And so, you know, it's, it's a completely fair question. And I don't know that I have the answer because, yeah, things may change. Um, you know, the other thing is, uh, the, um, and this gets a little political, but, um, you know, we have a, a fairly Republican government right now, but typically when we have a Republican president, then we wind up with a Democratic Congress and, you know, vice versa, right? And so right now, um, you know, we may be looking at a sea change in the midterm elections where we wind up with a very Democratic Congress who may try to roll back some of these changes, right? So it's very difficult to project, to project and predict. If you're risk adverse at all, you might give it an extra year. Um, and the worst case scenario is that you wind up paying a little bit of extra tax, right? Um, but on the other hand, you haven't locked yourself into some kind of structure that suddenly is very irrelevant or, um, you know, maybe even less advantageous. So that's a really great question, Chris, but, you know, it's just, you know, do you do it now or do you do it later, you know? That makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So a few other questions here. Um, Blaine asks, uh, manual day timers versus electronic digital kind, which is best in light of your comment about IRS attempt to send to have the date tested the ink and handwritten? <laughs> uh, can they do that with digital too? Best system. <laughs> Why do you want to know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, it's a really great question, Blaine. Um, but, I, you know, I go back to my answer. I think it was even a question before I was talking about the ink, um, which is that the IRS really wants to see uh, those contemporaneous records, right? And so if it's a handwritten log that we know was written, or we say, at any rate, we make the argument is written back in the day when you were taking the deduction, that's what the IRS really likes, and that's what they give quite a bit of weight to. Um, if, on the other hand, it's an electronic version, really, if even if it was created at the same time you took the deduction, I've had IRS agents make the argument that you could have made you know, modifications to that last week. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, I suppose um, were they, let's say worst case scenario, they actually do make that fraud referral. Um, I think that's incredibly rare, by the way, and I really doubt that would ever come up in my career ever again. Um, but let's say that they do. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a criminal investigation at that point. Um, and so they may not test the ink on the day planner, but they may do some kind of forensic test on your computer, right? And take a look at when the, uh, when the spreadsheet was modified last, um, when it was opened last, uh, you know, it, it, who knows what, what uh, kind of footprint is left there, but, you know, they may take a look at that as well. And it'd be the equivalent of looking at the ink. Um, but, you know, the argument I've always run into is just, well, this could have been created last week, right? Um, so they really want to see the contemporaneous written logs. And once again, that complies more with the language and the code and the regulations anyways. Um, and so uh, if you're, the IRS is always looking at the black letter of the law, you know, did you comply with the black letter of what that law says? And if it says that you need a log, uh, and, you know, it's kind of all envisioning the idea that this is a handwritten, you know, notebook kind of log. That's really what you need to have, right? Yeah, it is crazy. Yeah, it's, um, it's yeah, you know, dated. Um, but, you know, who, who said tax law would be the most uh, up-to-date and, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> up-to-date area? It's just not going to be the case. So Tyler has a question. Uh, just a clarification on the 750-hour rule. If I spend 325 hours flipping houses and 325 doing retail brokerage, it would be hard to qualify as a real estate professional because it's hard to combine those two separate activities. Tyler, I'm so glad you brought this up because this lets me go back and actually step through the rule here. Um, so I'm going to go back to my slide so we can just step through that rule. It's so complicated. You can see, you know, it's kind of, I always approach it a little bit with uh, uh, for lack of a better word, trepidation, I guess, just because, uh, you know, to try to explain this is so tough. Okay, so, you know, I'm going to use my flaming hoops here because that just kind of makes the most uh, sense to me. But uh, the first is that you're going to have to participate in a real property trade or business as defined by statute. Well, flipping, rehabbing, you know, that's going to be a real property trade or business. Retail brokerage is also a real property trade or business. So you've met that first bullet point there. Then you have to jump through flaming hoop number one. 
which says that you have to spend more than half your time pursuing real property trades or businesses. So I'm going to assume, you know, in your uh, in your example there that, you know, this is the only thing that you do. You're not working, you know, a part time or full time job somewhere else or whatever. If that's the case, great. You met flaming hoop number one. You threw it because more than half your time is spent, in, you know, flipping and doing the brokerage activity, right? Um, so let's jump through flaming hoop number two. You have to spend more than 750 hours in the year pursuing real property trades or businesses. Well, you meet that because 325 hours in flipping houses and 325 hours in the retail brokerage, perfect. You know, 750 hours in real property trades or businesses, you got it. The problem you're going to run into has to do with this material participation, and that's that last flaming hoop. So you have to ensure that you materially participate in all activities under one of these seven tests, right? So I was talking about the grouping election, and that's on this slide. You're right, you're gonna have a hard time probably grouping the retail brokerage with the flipping. And so I think we have two separate activities, and you're gonna to have to show that you materially participate in each of those activities, right? So we go to the material participation test, you're not going to meet the first rule because you didn't participate for more than 750 hours in either of the activities, right? But maybe you meet the second rule. Participation is substantially all of the participation by all individuals. If you're the only person involved with this rehab, and you can hire general contractors and those kind of things, it'd be an interesting argument, but my argument would be that you actually qualify under the second rule there. Um, but at any rate, you know, you're kind of the, the show, you're the one driving this rehab, you know, whatever. I would argue that you materially participate there. Um, you know, the retail brokerage, I think there's no problem with the second point there. You know, your, your participation is substantially all the participation by all individuals, there you go. Um, you know, it's really driven by your hours and, and what you do and, and your ability to make the, the deals, right? Um, so, so, you know, that kind of helps you step through there. Um, one other kind of nuanced point there that I might make is that in your example, you hit just 750 hours, right? Um, as I kind of mentioned in passing, the IRS is really good at just basically disallowing 50 to 100 hours right off the bat. Right, so if this were to actually go to litigation, you had 750 hours, the IRS stock position is gonna be only 600 hours applied. And so we're gonna to have to uh, litigate over those extra 150 hours. If you come to the table and you say, I have 950 hours, and the IRS is gonna disallow 100 of them, great, you're still over the 750 hours, right? So, um, you know, the ones that sit on the fence, where it's, you know, whether you have the 750 hours or not, those are kind of the tear jerkers and the ones that always, uh, you know, present the challenges, where the ones where you're well over that 750 hours, um, that's, that's more straightforward. But that's, you know, a little beyond your question there, but hopefully that helps, Tyler. Let me know, you know, if you want to talk more about that one. Okay, Leilani, um, do you advocate the IRA deduction? And if so, what type of IRA benefits real estate pros the best? Um, Self-directed IRA? Yeah, um, I guess I'm, that you do get an IRA deduction for a traditional IRA. Um, if it's a Roth IRA, you're not gonna get a deduction there. I guess uh, maybe I need to know a little bit more about the deduction you're talking about, but if you can get a deduction for contributing to an IRA, uh, say a traditional or you know any of the others that might give that deduction, go for it, right? I mean, lowering your taxable income is always a great move and uh, something that you absolutely want to look to do. So do I advocate for it? Absolutely. It's just you know whether you're going to qualify for it. Um, but what type of IRAs benefit real estate professionals the best? Um, yeah, Charles mentioned the self-directed IRA, which is absolutely true. Um, you need a self-directed IRA to invest in real estate because many of the the, um, the what do you call them, custodians, um, won't allow you to invest in real estate otherwise. Um, and you have to work with the particular custodian that does allow real estate. For instance, I when I started by setting up IRAs, I actually set up one at Edward Jones, and it technically was a self-directed IRA. Everything it was, everything said it was self-directed. Um, but Edward Jones as a custodian did not allow real estate investments. So, you know, I had the right type of IRA, but the wrong custodian in that case, if I wanted to invest in real estate. So self-directed IRA, absolutely something that you should look at. Um, from there, you can set up a Roth IRA, a traditional IRA. Um, if you're, uh, you know, you set up a, an S corporation, you have earned income, those kind of things, you can look at a SEP or a, even a simple, I think. Um, 
So, you know, there's a lot of different types of IRAs you can look at. The tax uh, implications when you take money out uh, differs, like a Roth IRA. Um, you know, there's, uh, by and large, the, the growth in the Roth IRA, um, you know, is, is tax-free. Um, traditional IRAs give you the deduction up front if you're looking for that. So it just kind of depends. Um, but by and large, for real estate professionals, um, a self-directed IRA with a custodian who allows you to invest in real estate, that's really going to be uh, the best one for you. So hopefully that helps a little bit frame that discussion. If there's more questions there, let me know. But, um, but otherwise, I think we're out of questions. So I think we're good. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, any parting words, Chris? Well, hopefully Chris hung with us. Okay. Uh, he might have actually dropped off, but this is Charles Roberts. So I just want to say thank you, uh, Peter McFarland from Long Law Group. Really, really helpful. We plan on doing more with you and podcasts and just getting your information out there. If you have any um, you know, legal or tax needs, I would suggest you might want to talk to Peter McFarland at Long Law Group. He's really, really good at this. Thank you for your time. And uh, again, Charles Roberts from Your Castle Real Estate. Thanks very much. Take care. Hey Charles. Yep. I'm still on. I just uh, I was 